Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, that was a good lunch, and I hope everybody got to walk around a little bit. Okay, we are going to keep moving forward to belonging, inclusion, anti-Asian hate, anti-discrimination subcommittee, um, and we're, I'm gonna turn it over to Kamal to take over from here and both do the introduction. I think you're doing the first recommendation also, correct? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Can you make sure you, you turn your mic on and you move it closer to you? Yes. There we go. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Shah uh, and my fellow uh, commissioners. Uh, uh, Louisa Blue and myself are the co-chairs of uh, this amazing subcommittee on belonging, inclusion, anti-Asian hate, and anti-discrimination. Um, been very, very honored to work with uh, uh, all of our subcommittee members uh, to include Emily Chen, Grace Wong, Daniel Day Kim, Nahid Qureshi, and Smitha Shah, uh, as well as our non-commissioned member, uh, Madiha Ahussein. And uh, uh, that, not to forget our fabulous DFO, Zayin Wu. Thank you. Um, so a, a brief summary of our meetings um, and presentations. We, our subcommittee uh, meets bi-weekly following the commission's fourth quarterly meeting on December 5th and December 6th. Subcommittee met on December 13th, January 10th, January 24th, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Yes, yes. <laughs> February 21st and March 7th, 2023. The subcommittee received presentations from the following subject matter experts who helped inform our recommendations. Mary McCord, Executive Director, Institute for Constitutional Advocacy and Protection, ICAP, visiting professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, uh, who provided an overview about hate and white supremacist ideology, as well as specific commentary about the context of hate incidents against AA and NHPI communities arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. We also heard from Kate Peterson, Director of State Victim Resource Division, Office for Victims of Crime, U.S. Department of Justice, Jasmine Daddario Fobion, Director of Discretionary Programs Division, OVC, U.S. Department of Justice. They provided an overview of the operations of OVC, including sources of funds, programs, grantees, and other information. The speakers also provided information about AA and NHPI serving grantees. We also heard from Cynthia Deedle, former, former FBI Special Agent and former Director, Civil Rights Reform, uh, Matthew Shepard Foundation. She provided information about the investiga investigatory operations and outreach mechanisms of the FBI and local law enforcement as it pertains to communities vulnerable to hate incidents, as well as ideas and initiatives to help improve hate crime reporting and tracking. We also spoke with Chris Xiong, thank you, under Sheriff San Mateo County, California, uh, provided inf who provided information on hate crimes investigations and reporting issues from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, so we have two, we have approved uh, uh, the following two draft recommendations to present uh, at our full commission meeting today. Um, I will cover the first, and uh, my fellow commissioner Emily will uh, present the second. Um, so uh, moving right into that, uh, recommendation one, establish permanent staff and agency to support WIAMPI. Uh, the problem statement. The White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, Weampi Commission, is established via Executive Order 14031. Since its inception during this current administration has been staffed by a number of part-time and temporary personnel that sometimes rotate through for assignments as short as three months. This undermines the President's advisory commissions ability to execute longer term goals, degrades institutional memory, and limits the effectiveness of the commission's efforts as it must constantly work through the churn of new staff. But excellent staff. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Recommendation. The federal government should establish a permanent home agency with permanent career and political staff and ongoing funding to support the work of WIAMPI and the President's Advisory Commission on AA and NHPIs. Um, if you wish, I can go into some of the rationale. Uh, sure. WIAMPI is a critical organization that works to improve the lives of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, Pacific Islanders across the country. However, for the initiative to truly be effective, it needs more permanent support staff. And here's why. Establishing more permanent st staff members would provide greater stability and continuity to the initiative's work. The current model of relying on short-term detailees can lead to inconsistent progress and limited institutional memory. With permanent staff in place, WIAMPI could continue its work even as key personnel change over time. The President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans and the President's Advisory Commission on Advancing Educational Equity, Excellence, and Economic Opportunity for Hispanics have always been housed within the U.S. Department of Education and have full-time career staff that support these commissions. The um, WIAMPI should mirror those other President's Advisory Commissions and have full-time career staff. More permanent staff would enable WIAMPI to expand its reach and impact. With additional resources, WIAMPI could work more closely with local communities, engage more stakeholders, and carry out more robust public education and outreach efforts. This, in turn, will help raise awareness of the issues faced by AA and NHPIs and lead to more effective policy solutions. Permanent staff would also help to ensure that WIAMPI's work is guided by a clear strategic vision and plan. With more staff in place, WIAMPI could work more closely with partners to set long-term goals, develop and implement effective strategies, and track progress over time. This would ensure that WIAMPI is making the greatest possible impact and that it is accountable to the communities it serves. More permanent staff would also help create a more sustainable funding model for the initiative by the use of full-time employees, FTEs. Currently, WIAMPI relies on contributions from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services divisions that can be difficult to secure and are unpredictable. By establishing a stable staffing structure, the initiative could better position itself to seek out other funding sources, such as grants and partnerships, that could help us sustain its work into the future. Finally, having more permanent staff could help create a more professional and effective organization. With more staff in place, the initiative could invest in training, technology, and other resources that would help build its capacity and improve its overall performance. This, in turn, would help to ensure that the initiative is providing the highest quality of service to AA and NHPI communities. That's all. Thank you, Kamal. I think. Thank you. Um, I think this is a recommendation we've all been waiting for, so I appreciate it. But I'm going to open it up for conversation and for comments. Teresita? Earlier, I made a comment about uh, collaboration with other commissions, but I understand those commissions are in a different department. I think it would be good to know, uh, it, you know, the advantages of trying to stay with HHS or trying to be in an organization where the other commissions are. Thank you. So we, we did uh, look into that a little bit as well. We explored uh, whether it would be advantageous for us to uh, be housed elsewhere. Uh, my understanding is uh, from the conversations that we've had uh, uh, is that uh, HHS allows us to do the breadth of work uh, that we are charged with. The other commissions um, don't have such a large uh, charge. Um, so uh, I think uh, my, my personal opinion is that, that uh, HHS is probably the best place for us. So just a question, if there was any inquiry done on why the difference between this not being a permanent commission and how some commissions are permanent. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I believe that uh, the other commissions also have to be uh, reauthorized, uh, unless I'm not, uh, unless I'm mistaken about that. The the part that is permanent, though, I think they have permanent staffing and permanent lines of funding uh, that uh, I believe one of them gets from uh, from Congress. Uh, they've figured out some sort of a legislative way to do that. So we can we can follow the same model and try to to replicate that within our own commission. Yeah. Kimberly. So uh, since we are through an executive order, are you recommending that uh, how would we get a legislative solution? Yeah, I, I think we still remain. Uh, uh, there are benefits to remaining uh, a White House commission, right? So. It, so you'd have to have that executive order to initiate us uh, each time. But uh, legislatively, we could ask Congress for a line of funding uh, for our initiatives and staff. And I, I don't know the details of that, but uh, that's one of the things we would like to do is to reach out to those other commissions and say, hey, how, how did you guys uh, secure this? How did you go, to, go about getting this? Smita. Um, thank you. Um, so I'll just add, first of all, thanks, Kamal, for the recommendation and for the committee. I, um, I think it's amazing, the work that you do. I, I will add that um, it's sort of extraordinary what's been accomplished by the commission to date. Um, and, you know, the other day somebody was asking me how many meetings we've had, and we've had four meetings. And um, I think this is our fifth meeting. And... Um, to be able to advance these rolling recommendations. You know, we don't have a draft, or the commission members are drafting the recommendations, but it's all of the support of the staff that's allowing us, for the team, that's allowing us to do what we do. And it's really, you know, all of the public comments that we get, you know, the push out to make sure, and it's not just us. We're getting input from the public. We were able to roll out these economic equity summits that were one of the first recommendations. I'll talk a little bit about more later. Um, but all of this great work and that engagement comes from the extraordinary staff um, and team that's been working with us. And we've been doing it with a rolling group, but imagine how much more we could do if we have um, some permanency. And, and again, the team comes in, you know, Caroline started with us a few months ago and she'll be rolling off and she's been amazing and Zayan and Sarah too. And um, so I, I, I just wanted to make sure that that's noted that, you know, all of the great work that's been done, um, how much more of a difference could we make? I would add one other thing too, that a lot of the recommendations that we also make at least on, for example, the economic equity committee, while it is, while it's thought of with Asian Americans in mind, it's also thought of with just small business as a whole. And so the everything that we're thinking about actually benefits a variety of underrepresented communities as a whole. So having that support would be extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Smita. Mia? Yeah, I was just thinking about sort of how do we how do we get there to get like permanent staff? Um, in terms of funding lines, et cetera. And I don't know if it's a requirement for maybe the next presidential um, executive order to include something like that that would have sort of somewhat of a, a funding stream directly to fund people for the amount of time that the commission is available, um, which would mean that they would have to go through a hiring process or some type of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, recommendation or something like that. Um, and then also whether we're, we're sort of also asking that the president like request from Congress directly a line of funding um, for this commission and its initiative. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys want to parse that out a little more or if you want to just like say, hey, this is what needs to be done. You figure out how to make it done, make it doable, whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, great points, Mia. Um, very thoughtful. Uh, we we did consider all the above. And uh, to me, I, I, I wanted to leave it uh, 
uh, less prescriptive. Um, and so we decided that uh, uh, we would we would leave it a little bit a uh, little bit more vague, and just say, hey, look, uh, we need to do uh, we need more permanent staff, and how you go about the funding and how you go about this, that, or the other uh, is your headache. Uh, we're uh, we're just telling you what the problem is and what the solution needs to be. How do you how you get from point A to point B is sort of irrelevant to us, but uh, and that, I think that makes it a little bit easier on their end so that we're not simply tying off their hands and saying, look, you can only take this path. So um, that, that was our reasoning. Louisa? Yeah, I think part of it is we need the advice from the staff on how to proceed with this, because if it's going to take uh, legislation, then we have to build we have to build support. We have to get an author. Or we have to talk to KPAT, you know, uh, so that we can get legislation um, through Congress, right? But I'm hoping that we get some guidance there because I'm all down for moving legislation, right? But if there's a less uh, difficult way because legislation takes votes and that means we have to go lobby, right? Um, so, but if there's another way through executive order that makes it permanent, where it doesn't take an executive order every administration, I think that's what we would prefer. Yeah, and and also the other the other possibility is to establish uh, this commission as a congressional commission. But uh, but I I, I think um, having this be having this remain a White House commission. Is is better, you know, and uh, so that that's the only sort of danger about you know continuing to 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 focus on 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 Congress. Uh, you know, I think it's it's I think we we certainly should approach uh, uh, Congress to see if there is a legislative way to help fund what we what we need, but uh, but not at the danger of. of turning this into like a congressional commission. I, I, I think all of us would prefer that this remain a, a, a White House commission. Grace Crystal's gonna just make a point really quickly. Yeah, I'm just gonna make, make a point of clarification. So the commission and the initiative, the president has included funding for um, the White House initiative and the commission within his uh, budget request, and he did last year as well. Now, you know, it is up to Congress to fund that and Congress did not fund us, um, you know, last fiscal year. I did also wanted to flag just as a point of clarification for everybody, including those tuning in. So the commission is not permitted to lobby Congress. You are uh, allowed to make recommendations that go to the president, one of which could be theoretically if you want to suggest legislation. Um, these commissions, these presidential advisory commissions, and you've alluded there are, you have sister commissions in the black, Hispanic, Native American communities. Um, there's an HBCU commission as well. Uh, so. They are created of one of two ways. It's either um, through legislation, which requires you know being passed in both the House and the Senate and signed by the President. Um, not an easy lift to do, but that's something that can be done. And then also through executive order. So most of the commissions, including ours, is um, created through an executive order. The um, you know, and that is up to the discretion of the President at the time. So that is why you see for our initiative and our commission, uh, we have actually moved every administration to a different agency. The other, the other commissions and the other initiatives have stayed at the same department, um, and they have, as was alluded earlier, a much more narrow scope than you all do, than this commission. It's always been very broad. Um, for the others, they're much more heavily focused on education. Um, under this administration, their mandates have been expanded a little bit, but still nowhere near the same scope as what we have for this commission. So just wanted to clarify. Kevin. So just to clarify, so based on what you're saying is that the president gets to do the executive order, the commission gets formed, but what's the mechanism to get the permanent staff funding to keep you in one place? Can the president just say, I am going to keep HHS here forever and ever? How did the other two groups get that permanent home for the staff? So I, I don't know the answer to that. I just know what the others, they have, because they have such a narrow scope and have been predominantly focused on education, they have always been at that department. Our initiative and commission were at the Department of Education under Obama for eight years. And then we moved 
you know, to uh, Commerce under the Trump administration and now to HHS. So we're kind of the outlier. And again, it's because our scope is so broad. We also get different inputs. And when I say we, this, you know, the administration broadly gets inputs from the community about where to house it. So there was a big push from the community to put it at HHS under this administration. Um, you know, although it's been held at different, you know, agencies under prior administration. So there's no, and the president, the other thing too, President Biden can do, you know, can issue his executive order. Um, but then if there's a new president that comes in, and we saw this under Obama, right, after President Obama's uh, term ended, President Trump came in and he moved the, he moved the initiative and the commission. And then same thing with, you know, President Biden. So it's not like we can dictate beyond the term of a presidency, uh, where this would go if it's created through executive order. Okay, I'm gonna close this conversation. I think um, what we hear is a lot of support for, but a lot of questions on the mechanics of how to do it. And um, and maybe maybe just we're thinking about if, if post this, if there's a specific type of recommendation. I do think having it in the president's budget matters. Even if it's not always funded, it's important that it's in there because if it's not in there, it's not even it's not even possible. So making sure it's in the president's budget um, and and pushing them for that budget to 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 include that is important. I mean, so uh, we could we could amend it to add that uh, that line to make sure that we include uh, funding in the president's budget for uh, for Weompi. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Is that okay with the fellow commissioners? Yeah. Okay, excellent. We are going to keep moving forward. And I believe, Emily, you are presenting the next recommendation. Yes. Recommendation two. Uh -huh. oh, thanks. Recommendation two, increase access to victim services for AA and NHPI victims. Just want to share some alarming statistics with you. According to a recent national survey of over 1,000 AAPI respondents, one in five Asian Americans and one in five Pacific Islanders experienced a hate incident in 2020 or 2021, with 62.9% reporting verbal harassment, 16.1% reporting <laughs> physical assaults, and 8.6% reporting online harassment. There was a 339% increase of reported hate crimes against the AAPI community members from 2020 to 2021. And a 2022 survey of over 2,400 AAPI women showed that during the previous year, 74% of AAPI women reported personally experiencing racism and or, or discrimination. 38% report experiencing sexual harassment and 12% reported experiencing gender and or race-based physical violence. Because AA and NHPI victims are significantly less likely to contact law enforcement or ask for assistance following a hate crime, investment in programs and resources that communities trust is particularly important. AA and NHPI-based organizations often play the role serving as volunteer um, or unpaid liaisons and interpreters for mainstream organizations that lack the experience and expertise working in AA and NHPI communities. Additionally, when AA and NHPI victims reach out for help, they often are unaware or unable to navigate these programs. The Victims of Crime Act is the largest federal funding source supporting victim services in the United States. The Office of, uh, for Victims of Crime, OVC, administers victim services funding as well as victims compensation, primarily through state formula funding. During fiscal year 2023, the President requested $1.6 billion for crime victims fund programs. When requested by our subcommittee, OVC was unable to produce data on how many AA and NHPI culturally specific organizations receive funding, in particular related to hate crimes. OVC should strengthen its data 
collection and reporting of data about the primary and preferred languages that crime victims speak, read, and write. Such data would be useful to measure accountability for access to funding for underserved communities, including developing benchmarks for state and or territorial funding and planning and engaging in culturally specific organizations as well. OVC has the power to encourage and enforce, but they do not obligate their grantees to engage in language access assessment and planning to ascertain and address the needs of community members whose first primary spoken language is not English. Here's our recommendation. The Office for Victims of Crime, OVC, and the Department of Justice should increase the availability of and accessibility of victim <clears throat> services for AA and NHPI crime victims, including victims of bias and hate incidents. This includes addressing barriers to funding for culturally specific organizations that are trusted in AA and NHPI communities by one, investing in increased outreach, both by OVC and grantee states and territories about funding opportunities. Two, modifying OVC's funding agreements with states and territories to motivate grantees to increase the accessibility of pass-through funding to culturally specific organizations serving AA and NHPI um, and other black, indigenous, and people of color communities. And three, supporting OVC grantees and subgrantees to strengthen the cultural relevance of programs and linguistic ca capacity to serve AA and NHPI communities. Thank you, Emily. And those statistics are jarring. Um, I am going to open it up for conversation. Questions? Victoria. Yeah, thank you so much for that recommendation. And, you know, I'm reflecting this week because we are um, hitting that two year anniversary, right, of the March 16th spa shooting. Um, and as our communities are, you know, uh, reliving the grief and also remembering uh, the victims, I, I think these recommendations are so important. Um, and I, I, I want to, you know, go back to that number two piece, right, of, of talking about um, making uh, funding opportunities more accessible, right? Uh, for the communities. Um, we are two years out and still we haven't seen an increase. I haven't seen an increase in a lot of the organization's uh, ability or capacity um, to access these grants. Um, and it's not because the nonprofits or the organizations aren't uh, able to. They've been doing this work. They've been serving and supporting the, the AA and HPI communities in the respective territories and areas. Um, it's just because this process is inaccessible, right? Uh, match funds, the requirements for these organizations to um, step forward to access these funds, it, you have to go the extra, extra mile, right? And also getting grant writers, getting, um, you know, oftentimes uh, organizations don't have the experience in this field to, to help support them. So I, I really appreciate, you know, making sure that this language, right, to talk about the accessibility, but also pushing it further, right? And um, hoping to demand that we, We've seen, you know, through COVID that there's been exceptions and accessibility, um, you know, um, support around, um, you know, increasing the access to some of these services, right, that are provided, especially during the pandemic. I know it, it, it's possible, right, especially in time of crisis. And this is definitely a time of crisis in our communities as we, the president is in California right now in Monterey Park, right? Um, so I just, I, I appreciate this. I, I just... I just wish that we could move it a little bit further in demanding an emergency kind of response, right, to the accessibility of grants for these nonprofits who are doing the work and need a little bit more resources to help support our communities. Um, first, I want to thank you for including disabled NHPI uh, and A. Um, victims. Um, we know that particularly in uh, those communities, uh, 
specific parts of the community that um, it's even greater risk um, of dealing with those issues. So I was wondering if we could actually add um, one small part in um, the number two um, part of the recommendation that says um, grantees to an, um, AA, uh, wait a minute, sorry, serving organization, or uh, organization serving AA and NHPI, um, comma, other black indigenous people of color communities and organizations that serve disabled, um, uh, marginalized communities or, uh, other disabled, uh, BIPOC, uh, communities. Tarsita. So my comment actually speaks to Commissioner Hoon's concern. Uh, my recommendation is um, an edit to recommendation number two. Instead of saying uh, modifying OVC's funding agreements, it's requiring OVC's funding agreements with states and territories to motivate so not to motivate, but to actually require grantees to increase not just accessibility, but to increase pass-through funds granted to culturally specific organizations. Sorry, can I just clarify? Changing modifying to requiring or changing, okay, so requiring OVC's funding agreements with states and territories to require grantees? Yes. Okay. And then the, the next part is that in, instead of saying to increase accessibility of pass-through, delete accessibility. So instead it should read to increase the pass-through funds granted to culturally specific organizations, et cetera. And then I would add Mia's comment about adding Got it. organizations with disabilities. Got it. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. M Michelle. Um, I, I think along the same lines on item number two, I think it would be helpful to understand what are the accessibility issues? Is it because, because I think we need specificity there. Are there specifics required to get those grants? For example, is there a, a match requirement? Is it, what is, what is it that's making it tough to access so we can be clear there? or if we can encourage, right now in philanthropy, there are multiple kinds of funds that are encouraging this work. And so how do we, how do we make recommendations on how to make this pot of money more accessible? Is it public-private partnership? It's a grassroots organization who's not received this before. Is it eliminating the one-to-one the -one match or if there is a requirement? It would be helpful to understand why it's not accessible. Emily, did you want to add here? Grace. I'll try and respond to all of those comments. Um, I think with respect to Victoria's um, comment about uh, emergency funds, when we met with the agency, they did talk about them being, being able to do that, that they had um, resources available to uh, address situations like what happened in Monterey Park. Um, and the question just is whether or not they have existing grantees at the state level to be able to get the resources out quickly. And so that was one of those areas where if you, you know, your traditional grantees that you've always have have never worked with these communities and they don't have relationships with the, the impacted communities, how do you actually you know, push the, the dollars out quickly enough. And so that was one of those areas where we encouraged them to, you know, try to expand their pool of grantees. And it speaks to Michelle's comment about um, what makes these grants, you know, not very accessible. And I will say that, you know, these are longstanding funds that have been there. It's a traditionally uh, just, you know, uh, what's the term? It's um, they're funded by formula, so by population, which is, you know, speaks to earlier things that we talked about, about, you know, how many people, you know, what the population is, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, some of the grantees have been, have been getting these funds for three decades. And it's, you know, done through the state. The state has a lot of discretion as to how it disperses those dollars. And if they've got powerful institutions that have had these funds for 
decades, like that's part of the challenges is trying to like open up that whole process and getting the state to do more to be able to um, reach out to communities that it's not funded before and you know have them do a little bit more work, right, in terms of, of that process. There is a match requirement, and so um, there is that barrier there. The state has capacity to waive, you know, request waivers, um, and whether they or not they do is another question, and that's another area of labor that they, you know, would have to engage in. So, I mean, there's a lot of pieces at the state and territorial level that um, it would be helpful to have the federal government push <laughs> a little harder in terms of, of um, you know, those changes and those requirements. And, and as it speaks to the requirement um, question, I mean, we've thought a lot about whether you can require through some of these um, grants to, you know, place certain conditions. And, you know, some of us would argue that you can, and others would argue that it's unconstitutional. And so um, that's kind of the reason we ended up with motivate versus require, because we've had that debate about at least law enforcement grants um, in another context. And so. Teresita. Sorry. This is where I think as a commission, we should really strongly signal what we want and motivate is a nice word, but we know we are constantly ignored. So to the extent that we use a different word that's much stronger, I think that's important. Uh, the other comment is that those match requirements from my experience are typically of the government, of the state or local government. So as you said, they can choose to waive that or not pass it on at all. Now, in Washington state, there are certain streams of those pass-through fundings where there's language that specifically talks about emergent, not emergency, emergent communities or first-time grantees where, you know, it, it's slightly different process so that it is accessible. So, you know, it, it, it's... It's a different way of thinking, and I think the messaging to these different agencies is that they have to think differently than just giving the money to those traditional agencies who have grown because of those traditional grants. Yeah. Victoria, do you still have your card up, or are you? Oh, okay, Smita. Thank you. Um, I, I liked, I, I want to just emphasize, I really like Teresita's um, modifications to it to make it require that um, grantees that OVC is going to modify their agreements and that they are required to um, give pass-through funds. I also wanted to just um, comment on item number one um, from recommendation to investing in increased outreach. If I understood this correctly, OVC is also providing funds to culturally specific organizations. So what I'd like to suggest is if we can modify number one to say it's investing in increased outreach, both by OVC, grantee states and territories, and culturally specific organizations, so that the organizations are directly getting um, some knowledge or outreach regarding these programs. Um, and then I'd also, um, and I, I, I wonder if there's a way to also, you know, was we did these economic summits, which were already approved. Can we also recommend that OVC come participate in these economic summits to meet? Because we have community organizations that are being invited to it, so we could do it right away. Um, and I don't know, you know, so that would be another one. I don't know if you want to put it in this recommendation or if that they can just be now included as we're going into different states. Grace, I see you look a little perplexed. perplexed. I'm looking at, I mean, just in terms of that, uh, that adding the culturally specific organizations there, I mean, if, are you suggesting that, I mean, the main way that OVC interacts with with um, these grant programs is through the states and territories. And so they do have like, you know, a discretionary um, grant program as well that is, you know, one big, big um, grantee that as it relates to, but it's also a pass-through entity. And then, so I don't know if that's what you mean, but, but right now I don't think they're directly contracting with culturally specific organizations. 
I didn't so, realize this is since I've been facing this way. I didn't realize the edits were happening behind <laughs> me the whole time. Um, so that's totally helpful. Um, I, I think that I, I'm very open on how to do it. I just wanted to make sure that the cultural organizations were directly referenced in that outreach, whether it's by OVC or the states or both. Um, so if it's you know OVC and the grantee states and territories, I, I, I'm less familiar with the mechanism okay. of how okay. it works, okay. but just wanting to that see that culturally sense. specific yeah. organizations are, are um, I don't want to use the word targeted, but you know are the ones that are being reached out, reached out to, and then possibly saying, for example, through the economic summits, if that's again, if that's the appropriate use, or if saying that you know they should be invited going forward since they're already in play. I think just putting in the two gets at what you're. Yeah. So I'm going to close this conversation, but I think here. Um, Crystal and team, I would just say, as the economic summits are going through, making sure we're inviting OVC to those summits and that they are part of that just as an outcome. Sure, and I will clarify that um, the Department of Justice does has usually sent a representative to these summits, or at least our past two. We've had someone from the Community Relations Service, though, CRS. Um, we can request to see if it might be possible to get someone from OVC instead, so we will keep that in mind. Can I suggest, in addition to the federal agency, that the actual grantee states that are responsible for choosing who gets funded at the local level also be invited? Be invited. <laughs> Great. Thank you. All right. We're going to move forward with Economic Equity Subcommittee. Thank you for the past two recommendations. Yeah, come on. Uh, I neglected to mention our right. priority issue areas. If I could just mention those real quick. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, our priority issue areas are supporting leadership opportunities for AA and NHPI individuals in government, business, nonprofit, and media, uh, education about AA and NHPI communities, standardizing hate crimes and hate incident definitions, increasing resources for victims, preventing gun violence targeting AA and NHPI communities, increasing federal transparency on data regarding domestic terrorism and white supremacist organizations, alternative means of reporting hate crimes or hate incidents, improving federal data collection of hate crimes and hate incidents, and lastly, prevention of anti-Asian hate in all spheres of life, including me media, business, education, government, and online forums. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, we're gonna move forward with the Economic Equity Subcommittee. Uh, we are, I'm going to turn it over to Smita, who is going to introduce, and then I believe uh, she'll follow, then we'll have conversations. Yes, thank you, Chief. Um, okay, so the Economic Equity, Equity Committee, um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-chairs, Ajay Bhutaria and Simon Pang. Ajay is on screen with us. Um, Simon is with the president in Monterey Park right now. Um, we also have our amazing members, Louisa Blue, Dr. Kimberly Chang, Carrie Doy, who is also with the president of Monterey Park, Michelle Kauhane, Kevin Kim, and I, Jen Poo, and our DFO, our fantastic DFO is Caroline Goon. Thank you so much for all of your help. I'm going to start by talking about our um, economic summits. Um, so we, uh, as you all know, the commission um, the Economic Committee, Equity Committee made a recommendation for economic summits, which everyone approved back in May of last year. The president put that forth in September, and we've started to see the rollouts already as um, starting January. In January 2023, the White House Initiative on um, Asian Americans and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders launched um, the series in partnership with the Small Business Administration and other federal agencies. It was directly driven by a recommendation from the Commission's Economic Equity Subcommittee. The series is connecting AA and NHPI businesses and community leaders with critical federal and local resources to advance economic equity in this nation. The aim is to host up to eight summits across the country in this year. Commissioners have been able to attend the summit so far in Philadelphia and Chicago. Um, we had four commissioners in Philadelphia. Sarah, Commissioner Min joined us, Commissioner Pang, Commissioner Butoria. I was present as well. Um, 
and look forward to upcoming ones next week in Seattle and New York. And Commissioner Poo joined me in, in Chicago. We're both Chicagoans, so we're very excited to have that. Um, the summits have included tracks for both small businesses and community nonprofit leaders. Attendees have been engaged and excited to hear directly from regional offices from a dozen federal agencies. Participants are hearing directly from federal agencies like SBA, Treasury, CFBP, HHS, and other agencies about federal resources and opportunities available to small business owners. I should note it was the first meeting in Philadelphia. It was extraordinary. We had um, both um, Director Guzman from the SBA as well as Ambassador Tai came. So to have two cabinet level members involved in that first meeting, which again, there should be, I can't even, um, express the amazement with the WIAMPI team because we they pulled this together in under three weeks, I feel like. They had extraordinary resources. We had um, an amazing participation by the community. People came in from New Jersey um, to participate in this. So it's really what the resources available at that meeting, I have to tell you, when I was starting my business, I would have killed for those resources. I mean, it was really an extraordinary opportunity. Same thing in Chicago. We, you know, being the second one, we had a few more people in the room. But again, the resources that were available, we had the regional representatives from HHS and other agencies as well. Um, and we actually, it was funny, in the middle of the meeting, there were at least two people that um, we were able to help solve problems and get them moving on their businesses. So really an extraordinary um, opportunity. So slide two. Are we on site too? Okay. Um, topics range from federal contractors, contracting to accessing capital, to learning about counseling services available to small business owners. Some attendees have even begun the process of starting their own business. Um, and again, I know of at least two who um, were in the process and struggling um, or becoming a certified minority business as a result of the summit. On the community nonprofit side, participants appreciated getting connected to federal programs and resources on worker and employment rights, civil rights, and more. Participa participants are also able to aid in the economic development of their community by hearing about resources from regional funders and grant makers who are investing in the AA and NHPI community. In Philadelphia, we had people from the local Philadelphia Chambers of Commerce as well as Philadelphia local agencies that are commun supporting communities. Same with Chicago, World Business Chicago came. As we know, public-private partnerships are key to ensuring the economic well-being of AA and NHPI communities. We look forward to future summits and the impact of this work. So, thank you all. It was really, I hope you will be able to attend one as they come to your city. All right, um, now going on to our priority issues area. Um, so we've seen some of this before, but we wanted to, we've made, you know, continue to refine um, opportunities for small business. As you know, we've sort of broken this out in a few different categories because economic equity isn't just about business, it's about individuals, it's about workers, and it's about community development. So. Opportunities for small business, increase, uh, increasing opportunities for small businesses, including exports. You'll see a recommendation about that today. Opportunities for small and community banks to participate in federal programming. On the access to job training and workforce development side, worker access to childcare, paid leave, and long-term care across all industries. Living wages, access to benefits, and training opportunities jobs of the future and workforce development, opportunities for A and NHPI workers, addressing income inequality and wage gap for A and NHPI women, access for awareness and awareness around grants, contracts, and loans, and compliance and regulations, um, reviewing compliance and regulations related to workforce development and apprenticeship programs, as well as regulations regarding small businesses job opportunities, workforce development, and making sure they're inclusive of AA and NHPI issues. We had a number of fantastic presenters this time um, as we continue to explore some of our different thinking. Um, Summer Lee Hunani Silva, Senior Advisor for Native American 
Native Hawaiian Affairs, Office of the Secretary, U.S. Department of Interior, provided an overview of the DOI's initiatives for the Native Hawaiian community, including its draft consultation policies and procedures, Hawaiian Homes Commission Act oversight, and Native language preservation efforts. Ex Ex City, Exodi Row um, the third Associate Administrator for the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, the Ostibu Office for GSA, Paul Martin, Director of IT Services Contract Operations Division, GSA, and Karina Jackson, Acting Director from the Small Business Compliance and Goaling Division, um, Ostibu, GSA. They provided an overview of the GSA contracting and procurement process, including the selections, awards, and post-awards process, as well as data related to the AA and NHPI communities. We asked Arun Venkat, I can't even do this, and this is my community, Arun Venkatharaman, Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Global Markets and Director General of the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service International Trade Administration, who provided an overview of the resources available to small businesses and information related to the increase of global exports from the United States. William Beach, Commissioner of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistics, U.S. Department of Labor. He provided an overview of the Bureau of Labor Statistics and shared relevant data requiring industries that AA and NHPI workers are concentrated in, including low-wage industries. So it's been a busy couple of months. Um, and from this, we were able to pull together one recommendation, which I will ask Ajay to present. Ajay? We can't hear Ajay. No, before. Uh, we got, hold on. We yeah, got you. Thank you, Smita. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, Chief Commissioner Sonal, before I move, I'll just take a moment to say this. I'm overflowing with deep gratitude and heartfelt appreciation for outstanding leadership and tireless efforts of Erika Mortisubu and VIP leadership, Crystal Kai, Rebecca Lee, Monica, and your sub Chief Commissioner Sonal Shah and our DFOs, Ben Raju, in making the economic summit a in making the economic summit uh, series a reality and launching the nationwide economic summit, your unwavering commitment to uplifting the ANHPI small businesses and creating new and helping in creating new rural and urban jobs is nothing so sort of remarkable. I'm in awe of your ability to pull together resources from multiple agencies and implement this initiative so quickly. Your dedication to this cause is truly inspiring. I cannot thank you enough for all that you have done. May I request everybody to give a big round of applause for these incredible individuals. They truly deserve it. Thank you. Uh, so moving to the recommendation, the problem statement. ANHPI small businesses face barriers in accessing international markets, limiting their potential for growth and expansion. As a result, they miss out on the opportunities and benefits of exporting their products and services. So increasing exports for small businesses in the U.S. can bring a lot of benefits such as increased revenue and job creation, exposure to new markets and customers, and access to a larger pool of suppliers and partners. ANHPI small businesses are diverse, they have unique characteristics, and they are an essential part of the American economy. But by providing them with the support and resources they need to expand, expand their export operations, we can help them to grow and thrive, which will ultimately benefit the entire economy. So the recommendation is by June 30, 2024, the federal government should provide support and resources to ANHPI small businesses to help them expand their export operations in order to help reduce U.S. import-export trade imbalance. In addition, the steps below will help to bring an increasing number of AA and HPI small businesses into the export marketplace by increasing awareness of tools and resources available through the Commerce Department, United States Trade and Development Agency, and the Small Business Administration for small AA and HPI owned businesses looking to expand their export via targeted outreach sessions with ANHPI small businesses. 
increase outreach to ANHPI communities and organizations to raise awareness of the benefits of exporting for small businesses. <clears throat> Gather and share data on export demands from other countries with ANHPI small businesses, which will establish measurements to track if ANHPI small businesses are eligible, matched, and benefiting from these data on export demands. Finally, provide training and education programs to ANHPI small business owners interested in becoming exporters on how to effectively navigate the export process and identify potential international market for their products and services. Also, we should utilize US consulates and embassies to provide ANHPI small businesses with global market outreach, including matchmaking and network opportunities with foreign buyers and distributors. Develop targeted outreach programs to connect small ANHPI owned businesses with potential international buyers and partners. Increase funding for market research and trade missions to help small ANHPI owned businesses identify new export opportunities. Invest in trade promotion and export assistance programs that specifically target small ANHPA owned businesses. Offer grants and low interest loans to small ANHPA owned businesses to help them invest in the infrastructure and equipment needed to expand their exports. Provide technical assistance to small ANHPA owned small businesses to help them comply with international trade regulations and standards. Facilitate trade missions and delegations to key international market to provide ANHPI small businesses with the opportunity to showcase their product and services to potential buyers and partners. All these measures will help increase small ex exports by the small businesses and will directly help benefit the entire country and our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. I'm gonna open this up for a conversation. Kevin. Ajay, um, I, I think we had talked about the Export Import Bank of the United States as well, so maybe, I think it's just inserting it. Commerce, in the first recommendation, Commerce Department of the United States Trade and Development Agency, comma, Export Import Bank of the United States, and then the Small Business Administration. Do you recall that? It can go in the first point. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? I, I just have a, a question. Um, and I know during the pandemic, I, there were a lot of resources that were available, but it didn't make it to a lot of the small businesses because of a lot of the language barriers. And of course, we're the language access subcommittee, right? Um, what were there considerations kind of in some of the, the conversations with, you know, the technical assistance and the support for, you know, some of the small businesses that maybe English as a second language or, um, you know, those with limited English proficiency? It's more of a question. Ajay, did you hear that? Uh, I could not hear the question clearly. I think Victoria was, let me see if I'm paraphrasing properly. Victoria was asking if you put in, t if there's any consideration, especially for small businesses with language access um, and language uh, limit, who have limited English proficiency. I, I think that's an excellent point and we, uh, we should add it. Yeah, maybe I would suggest um, putting in um, providing training, educational programs. So the third bullet point, provide training, educational program, and, and language support to AA and NHPI small business orders. Will that address it, Victoria, you think? You take a look. Yep. That's great. Yep. Thank you for your comment. I appreciate it. Other comments? Kevin, are you still... Are you gonna? No, no, I'm good. Okay, your your card was up though. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. If we have no comments, we have a break. <laughs> 